Shalom Havarim. Welcome, friends in Hebrew. My name is Tony Pino, and today we are going to uh, be looking at the topic, or at least I'm going to be sharing with you on the topic of the resurrection. And I have been revisiting the, this topic, reevaluating many of the passages, looking at them from their historical context and language and culture. And so I believe that uh, within my own personal theology that I might need to make some adjustments uh, from what I believed over the last 20 years or so, uh, something I've been doing for 20 years, you know, because I was in Western Christianity for, you know, most of my life. And the last 20 years, I definitely have been uh, coming out of some of the theological errors I believe that are in that, not all of it. There are definitely some good things with the theology of Western Christianity, but in general, there are definitely some things I have issues with. And uh, so, this is something we all do as we grow in our relationship with Yeshua, as we study the scriptures, we need to adjust our theology to what the scriptures teach. And that's something we're always looking and reevaluating for ourselves. Amen. And we just want to live in the kingdom. We want to live for Yeshua, worship him. He is our goal. He is our savior. And we want to honor him and we want to preach and minister the truth. Amen. That's our goal. So looking at this topic, the resurrection, I've got some things I want to share with you, some things that I'm thinking on. Uh, definitely wrestling with. And so I want to go ahead and share them with you today. Now, something that, that uh, needs to be said about this topic before we begin is, you know, definitely I've been doing a lot of end times study lately. This is where a lot of this is coming from, reevaluating some things. I've done uh, the book of Revelation and, you know, several other videos on end times. And so one thing has been leading to another to evaluate this this specific topic. So typically when I was in Western Christianity, the belief that I had was, of course, a pre-trib rapture, right? We know the Bible talks about a tribulation period, the great tribulation it speaks of in Revelation chapter seven. And so we know there is a tribulation period and I believe it's still to come. Some people believe it's already passed. I'm not a preterist. I do not believe in replacement theology and so forth. Um, and so I do believe that there's a lot still to come. But the pre-trib rapture idea of a resurrection of the righteous coming before this final great tribulation period, I don't hold to. Uh, and you'll see why here in the, this uh, teaching. A lot of this, though, has to do with that term, the church. Okay. And I believe that that it, you know, has many theological errors in it because that term follows with a certain theological uh, explanation. And so something, you know, they hold that the body of Messiah is something separate and distinct from Israel. And I don't hold to that. Israel has the covenants, has the promises, as Paul clearly teaches in Romans 9 through 11. And so the body of Messiah is within the nation of Israel. It's within her covenants. It's not something separate and distinct. I don't believe in dispensationalism or replacement theology, like I said before. So I think there's a misunderstanding when you use this term church, okay? If we would just use congregation or assembly or body of Messiah and read the scriptures in their context, I think we would not have that theology that is connected to that word church. It's more the theology than it is the word for me. So um, definitely that has helped to you know build upon what is called a pre-trib rapture. Because, you know, there is this resurrection of the righteous that meet Yeshua in the air, and then they go off, and they're considered the bride. And so they go off and have this wedding feast, and they have this great time while, you know, obviously Israel is going through the great tribulation period. Not only that, but there are others that are receiving the gospel and dying, uh, being martyred for the cause of Yeshua, and, you know, the church gets spared all that. Well, it just, it doesn't line up with scripture. It doesn't go consistently with scripture. Okay. Israel is the bride. She's being purified through the great tribulation time. So definitely we are grafted in. If you're a Gentile, you're grafted into her covenants, into the nation of Israel in that sense. She will be delivered. All right. And not to say that every single uh, ethnic Jew will come to Yeshua. I'm not saying that, but nationalistically, it will happen in the end. She will turn and cry out to Yeshua. Amen. And so she is the bride. We are all part of it. We all have our duties in that. Okay. Now, 
the next um, belief, which is connected to um, the resurrection, is a mid-trib or pre-wrath belief, something I don't hold to, okay? And, you know, again, many of those teachers that you listen to on that will use that term, the church, the church is raptured, the church is spared the wrath of Yahweh. You know, he will not bring his wrath upon his church. Well, that doesn't line up with scripture, okay? Number one, the term church is, again, going to lead you into that error. It's the assembly or body of Messiah, amen? And we can see throughout the book of Revelation that uh, many believers are going to go through the great tribulation, amen, and be saved. There's going to be more getting saved through there. But he's also, you know, pouring his wrath upon the wicked. He's limiting the, uh, the man of lawlessness and his kingdom. And uh, so we are the salt of the earth. So we will be there. The big thing that I have uh, more than anything on the issue of the pre-wrath is I don't think many of them have looked at the Greek terms there for wrath. There's basically two words there that you need to study. And so one has to do with a white throne judgment wrath. One has to do with being spared that. That is what we are spared, right? Through the blood of Yeshua, we will eternally be with him and not spared the wrath of Yahweh for being thrown into the lake of fire, okay? But the other wrath is a temporary wrath, okay? That is done. It's been done to Israel throughout history. The Hebrew scriptures, the prophets had to go through it. The remnant of the righteous had to go through it. And we will too, as believers in Yeshua. Again, we are the salt of the earth. So that temporary wrath is, number one, to try and test the righteous, to purify them, and two, to expose the wicked and punish the wicked for what they have been doing, okay? So no, I do not hold to a pre-wrath. I think that also, for me, is pretty easy to disprove on that, on that um, stage or that position. Uh, so for the last 20 years or so, I've held mostly to a post-trib rapture, okay? I, you know, the rat, there is a rapture in the Bible, all right? Paul's very clear that in a twinkling of an eye, we will all be caught up together with him. The dead in Messiah will rise first, and we will be caught up with him, okay? And so there's a lot to talk about in that arena also, but there is a rapture. And so will it happen at the end? of the great tribulation, or will it happen at the end of the millennial reign? These are some questions I've been asking myself, revisiting this position here. And so let's go ahead now, we'll go to the scriptures. First thing I wanna do is of course show you that there was a belief of a resurrection in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, again, when I say resurrection, I'm not talking about those that you read about in the scriptures that were, you know, that died and were raised not with glorified bodies, but raised and then died again. So I'm not talking about that group of people, okay? Yeshua raised Lazarus from the dead, but he died again. We're talking about people who come after Yeshua, where he is the first fruits of the dead. He has a glorified body, right? Remember, he has two natures. He eternally existed with the Father. He's of the same essence and nature as the Father, though distinct and separate. But then he took on a human nature, okay? Which, when he took it on, was mortal. All right, that is the nature that was put to death. And then he was raised to immortality with that nature. So he has two natures, okay? This is what we will, we will be raised to immortality, given a new body, all right? And so that's what we're going to be focusing in on uh, today. So let's go ahead and go to the scriptures now. First, I wanna show you some words of Yeshua, and then we're gonna go into the Hebrew scriptures. All right, so first things first, I wanted to show you the words of Yeshua here in Matiyahu, chapter 22, verses 31 through 32. Yes, uh, that is Matthew 22, 31 through 32. Yeshua says, but concerning the resurrection of the dead, haven't you read what was spoken to you by Elohim, saying, I am the Elohim of Abraham and the Elohim of Yisak and the Elohim of Yaakov. He is not the Elohim of the dead, but of the living. So I am also one that doesn't believe in soul sleep. I believe that when Yeshua was walking here, that Abraham and Yisak and Yaakov were alive, their spirits were alive, their souls were alive. All right, they were probably in a special place. I believe Yeshua calls it Abraham's bosom there. And, you know, 
I don't want to get off on a rabbit trail here, but just kind of letting you know where I come from on this. Okay, the body dies, the body decays, the body is gone. Okay, but the soul lives on, the spirit lives on, and you do not lose consciousness when you die, as far as my position. I'm going to do a teaching on that, the show, and refute the idea of soul sleep, something that was not even around, that idea was not even around in the first century, amen, or prior to that. So when we look at the Hebrew scriptures, okay, of course, when we get into uh, away from the Torah and we get into the Hebrew scriptures, the writings of the prophets and so forth, um, this is where you see the resurrection uh, really coming forth. Um, this is why the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection because they only believed in the works of Moshe, the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And so they did not believe in a resurrection, but we see a resurrection being shared and explained in the Hebrew scriptures. And we know that Yeshua, of course, he believed in a resurrection. He, he is the resurrection and the life. So uh, we know the Perishim, the Pharisees believed in a resurrection. And here are some of the passages I believe they would have used to argue their case. Now in Job chapter 14, now Job, just so you know, uh, probably lived during the time of Abraham and Yisak, and definitely lived after the flood. It's the oldest book in the Bible. Um, Job, you know, lived over 200 years, somewhere maybe around 240 or so. This is at the time where people were still living that long. We know Abraham lived to be 175 and so forth. Yisak and Yaakov, you know, lived well over 100, close to 100, you know, 140, 150, right, right in those, you know, areas there. So Job is right in that time frame. That's when the book was written at around that time. So it says here in chapter 14, starting verse 10, but man dies and is powerless. Man expires and where is he? As water evaporates from the sea and a river drains away and dries up, so a person lies down and does not rise. Okay, His body decays. He lies down and does not rise until the heavens are no more. Okay, oh, So there's a time limit until the heavens are no more people will not awake, okay, or be roused from their sleep, all right, we're talking again about the body, not about their soul, not about their spirit, the body lies down and decays and goes away, so verse 13, oh, that you would hide me in Sheol and conceal me until your wrath has passed, will you hide me in the grave, okay, talking about his body, oh, that you would set a time for me and then remember me, if a man dies, will he live again? Okay. Will he be raised from the dead? Will he receive a body? All the days of my hard labor, I will wait until my relief comes. All right. So he will wait until he is resurrected. He's looking for a resurrection. This is one passage people will tell you that they could see that you will believe in a future resurrection. Verse 15, you will call and I will answer you. Okay. The return of Yeshua, the calling out. Okay, we're going to see Yeshua say that they are going to hear his voice and they will all come out of their graves, right? So it says here, you will long for the work of your hands, for then you will number my steps. You will not keep track of my sin. My transgression will be sealed in a bundle and cover over my iniquity. So he knows his sins will be removed, the debt of his sins will be removed and he will be able to be raised from the dead, okay? Now we go on with Job here, chapter 19, verse 26, even after my skin has been destroyed, speaking of this, look at the topic here, it's the skin, it's the body, yet in my flesh, I will see Elohim. He will be raised again, a resurrection here is what we're talking about. He will receive a glorified body, all right? Now, Job in 33, verses 29 through 30, indeed, Elohim does all these things twice, even three times with a man to bring his soul back from the pit that he may be illuminated with the light of life. All right, so a resurrection here. Verse 30, pointing out a resurrection. Again, I believe the soul is conscious when it's in the pit, okay? It is the body that decays, the body that goes uh, and uh, ceases to exist, okay? But you do go down to the pit, and that is the general belief in ancient cultures uh, all throughout 
the first century and prior. There was no such thing as soul sleep again. Uh, that comes much, much later, that theology. So it wasn't even around, I believe, at this time. So just as a side note. All right, so we get into Job here. Now, I'm bringing you to Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, because we're talking about the end times, what I believe to be the great tribulation period here in these verses. So the king of the north, I believe, is the man of lawlessness. King of the south, typically in this chapter, points to the area of Egypt. And so let's go ahead and begin. Now, at the time of the end, okay, at the time of the end, to me, the great tribulation period time, the king of the south will attack him and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots, horsemen, and many ships. He will invade lands and pass through them like an overflowing river. He will also invade the beautiful land. Many will be overthrown, but these will escape his hand, Edom, Moab, and the chief of the sons of Ammon. That's the modern day Jordan of today. Okay, so he will not, again, control the entire globe. It says in verse 42, he will extend his hand against other countries. The land of Egypt will not escape. He will gain control over the hidden treasures of gold and silver, as well as all the riches of Egypt. The Libyans and the Kushites will also be under his feet. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him. See, other countries coming. Okay, so no, the anti-Mashiach or man of lawlessness will not control the entire globe. So he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. Right? He will pitch his tent, his royal tents, between the seas and the beautiful holy mountains. Yet he will meet his doom with no one to help. All right. So for me, he's going to meet his doom. He's going to be destroyed. Yeshua is going to come and destroy him. All right. So this is, in a sense, talking about the second coming of Yeshua, right? when he is going to be definitely gone and out of the way. And then it says in chapter 12, verse 1, remember, there are no chapters and verses. So this is the next thing to happen. Okay. Again, we're going to see this is why for me there is not a pre-wrath uh, belief here. It says at the end, uh, Alan, I'm sorry, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people will rise. There will be a time of distress such as never occurred since the beginning of the nation until then. Okay, speaking of Israel. So that's why, again, I'm not a preterist. I do not believe that all this happened in 70 CE. We are still awaiting the greatest tragedy that the nation of Israel will ever see. Okay, it didn't happen in 70 CE. It says, but at that time, your people, okay, who's the people of Daniel? Israel. Everyone who is found written in the book, okay, because it says the book, I connect this to the book of life, the book of life, okay? It's not books talking about deeds, but everyone written in the book will be delivered, okay? Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life and others to shame and everlasting contempt. This is a final judgment. This is all the context here is final judgment, white throne judgment. So we're not seeing anybody being raised prior to this. So when could this be occurring? Well, if you really get into it and ask, when is this occurring? Wouldn't it be after the millennial reign of Yeshua, after the thousand years? Could that be the greatest time of distress for Israel ever before? Even greater than the man of lawlessness period, the great tribulation, because, uh, Hasetan is going to be released from the abyss and he's going to gather his armies one last time. He's going to deceive the nations one last time and bring them against the holy people. Okay, could this be that time? I think it's possible. This is something I've had to relook at. So, one of two things it is either at the end of the great tribulation period where the man of lawlessness is destroyed, or it could be what we would see at the end of the thousand years. Now, this is the final white throne judgment. So that's why I now am thinking about, man, this might be the last event that happens at the end of the thousand years. Let's go ahead and go to Revelation and look at that. Uh, 
All right, so here we are in Revelation chapter 20, starting with verse 7. When the thousand years has ended, Satan shall be released from his prison and shall come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for the battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the Kedoshim. All right, this is right there in Israel. This would be Daniel's people, the holy people, okay? and the beloved city okay what's the beloved city Jerusalem. but fire fell from heaven and consumed them and the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are too and they shall be tortured day and night forever then i saw a great white throne and the one seated on it the earth and heaven fled from his presence but no place was found for them and i saw the dead the great and the small, standing before the throne. The books were open, and another book was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what was written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Sheol, the grave, gave up the dead in them. Then they were each judged, each one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Sheol was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death the lake of fire. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. This seems better to correlate with what happens in Daniel chapter 12. Okay. The greatest time of distress for Israel in her history, I believe could possibly be this time right here. This is what it could be talking about. And so then as far as we can tell right now, there you know, what we would call the rapture, the raising of the dead to meet him in the air would take place here. Okay. Uh, so we do definitely have a resurrection happening here. I believe it correlates with uh, Daniel chapter 12 better than at the end of the great tribulation. Uh, and so that's why I'm tossing this around here. It seems to connect better. All right. All right. Let's go on to the other passages now. All right, so here we are in Yochanan, chapter 5. Hold on one second. Just need a drink of water here. All right, I think we're better now. All right, so Yochanan, chapter 5, verses 25 through 29. Amen, amen, I tell you, this is Yeshua speaking, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of Ben Elohim the son of God. Those who hear will live. For just as the father has life in himself, so also he has granted the son to have life in himself. Also, he has given the son authority to judge because he is the son of man. Amen. So Yeshua showing his deity here, his divinity. He's being given authority to judge. Okay. And the grave is going to hear his voice. Right. Verse 28, do not be amazed at this for an hour is coming when all those who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will come to a resurrection of life and those who have done evil will come to a resurrection of judgment. Boy, this sure sounds like Revelation chapter 20. At the very end, the white throne judgment. OK, so there is a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. At the very end, when? After the millennial reign of Yeshua is what we're seeing here, okay? This is the words of Yeshua. Now, as we go on to Yochanan, John chapter 11, starting with verse 20. When Martha heard that Yeshua was coming, she went out to meet him. But Miriam sat in the house. Martha said to Yeshua, Master, if you had been there or been here, my brother wouldn't have died. But I know even now, that whatever you ask, you may ask of Elohim, he will give you. Yeshua said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Yeshua said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, shall live. Okay, so we see here the last day. So a lot of people will point towards when is the last day? Is it a period of time? Is it a particular day? Okay. Well, we know 
so far with what Yeshua is saying, what the scriptures are saying, it's the white throne judgment day that happens at the end of the millennial reign. Okay, so she is thinking there's going to be a resurrection, one resur at the final day of judgment. Let's move on. Yochanan chapter 6, verse 38 through 40. Okay, Yeshua speaking, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. Now this is the will of the one who sent me, that I lose not one of all he has given me, but raise each one on the last day. For this will... For this is the will of the Father, that everyone who sees the Son right, and trusts in him may have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So again, is the last day a period of time, or is it a specific day? All right, so far, everything that we're seeing shows it to be a specific day, okay? uh, which would be what after the millennial reign, the white throne judgment day. All right, let's go ahead. On to Yochanan, John chapter 6, verse 44. No one can come to me unless my father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. So over and over again, Yeshua is talking about the resurrection happening, the white throne judgment, the resurrection happening on the last day. All right. Chapter 6 of Yochanan, verse 54. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. All right, Acts 24, 15. In Elohim, I have hope, which these men also wait for, that there will surely be a resurrection of both the righteous and the unrighteous. When are we seeing that to happen? After the millennial reign of Yeshua, the white throne judgment will occur, where you have both the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. All right, so now we get into 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Um, we're going to start with verse 11. We'll start with verse 11 here. All right. Now, may our Elohim and Father himself and Yeshua, our Lord, direct our way to you. May Yahweh also cause you to increase and overflow in love for one another and for all people, just as we also do for you, in order to strengthen your hearts as blameless in holiness before our Elohim and Father at the coming of what our Lord Yeshua with all his Kedoshim, with all his holy ones. Okay, so people will see the coming of the Lord here, Yeshua, and they will think right away when he comes to destroy the man of lawlessness, but that's not what the scriptures say. Okay, when is the coming of the Lord? Could this be that this coming, specific coming, is talking about the destruction after the millennial reign time, okay? And when Yeshua comes seated on the throne to judge all the earth, he is going to take his seat. This is kind of related to, um, you know, uh, knowing that Yeshua is, all judgment has been placed in his hand. So is this coming of the Lord, right, with all his holy ones, now, don't think right away these are the saints, so to speak, the believers in Yeshua. Holy ones can just mean his holy angels, too. All right. They are also called the holy ones. Can it mean both? Yeah, it can mean both. All right. But just don't automatically think, oh, these are the saints. These are the believers. All right. So this is a little bit vague on exactly when. We can't give an exact uh, timing of when this will happen, but we do know uh, that this is speaking of. The resurrection is speaking of him coming, all right, and, uh, you know, making that final judgment, which is where the resurrection happens. So, all right, let's go ahead and go forward here to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, starting with verse 13. Now we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, okay? Basically, a metaphorical term for dead. Their bodies are dead in the grave. Okay, so that you may not grieve like the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so with him Elohim will also bring those who have fallen asleep in Yeshua. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself shall come down from heaven with a command, a shout 
with the voice of the archangel and with the blast of God's shofar. Now, this kind of this kind of reflects to me when Yahweh came down on uh, Mount Sinai with that shofar blast. Here comes the judge. Here comes the creator of the universe. Okay. And then it says, and the dead in Messiah shall rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left behind, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right. So can this easily happen at the end of the millennial reign? It can. It's not giving you an exact timing of it. We uh, theologically have always read well, it's going to, you know, this is the pre-trib rapture. No, this is the mid-trib rapture. No, this is the post-trib rapture, okay? And so we're reading that theology into this passage, okay? And so uh, will there be people alive at the end of the millennial reign? Sure, there will be. Could it be talking about them? And all of those who have died up until that time will be resurrected at that time to meet Yeshua in the air. And I am one that, believes it's kind of like the uh, picture of when a king goes away and he's been gone for a long time and he comes back uh, when the word comes that he is coming obviously there's dancing and singing there's you know a lot of musical and noise you go out of the city you go out to meet him and you bring him in with dancing and singing this is kind of a, a picture i think of the rapture and that's that we go, we meet Yeshua in the air and we escort him to the earth with singing and dancing. He has won the final victory, right? We are receiving uh, our eternal life right now. We're being judged now. We are going to enter into the new heavens and the new earth. So I think that can easily fit within these scriptures here too, okay? So again, he does not want you to be uh, uninformed, he says, about those who are asleep, right? For if we believe that Yeshua died and rose again, so with God, so I'm sorry, so with him, God will also bring those who have fallen asleep, asleep in Yeshua. For this we tell you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall in no way precede those who are asleep. When is this all going to happen? All right? Just says there's going to be a command shout. There's going to be a blast, a shofar blast. Can it still be during one of the Moedim of Yahweh, one of his feast days that we read about in Leviticus 23? Absolutely. It could still be on one of those times because all throughout the millennial reign, you will be, you will be, um, you know, worshiping, you know, Yeshua during those times, those, those feast days will be occurring. So I just, I feel that we have to look at this as a possibility. All right, let's move on. So now we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 20 through 28. But now Messiah has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Okay, that's why the other people who were so-called resurrected, all right, they don't precede Yeshua. Yeshua is the one who has eternal life. Okay, he has a resurrected, glorified body. So it says, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also has come through a man. Okay, so the death curse came because of Adam, right? For all in Adam, I'm sorry, for as in Adam all die, so also in Messiah will all be made alive, all right? The curse of death is going to be reversed by Yeshua, so all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Messiah the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Messiah, right? But which coming? Which coming of it? Is it? The coming where he destroys the man of lawlessness, or is it the coming that can happen at the end of the millennial reign? Are we talking about the coming where he's seated on his throne, you know, the white throne judgment at that coming? That's something we have to include into the conversation. And so, so far, I would say that is the stronger argument right now that we're seeing with the scriptures that we have read, the resurrection happening at the end with the white throne judgment. All right, let's go on. It says, then the end, verse 24, when his hand, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all rule and authority and power. So when is that coming? At the end of the millennial reign, okay? When he has destroyed death, thrown it all into the lake of fire, all right? The grave, death, everything. So 
it seems to be pointing more towards that time. Let's go on to verse 25. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subject underneath his feet. But when the psalmist says that all has been put in subject, it is clear that this does not include God himself, right? Meaning the Father, who put all things under Messiah. Now, when all things become subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to the one who put all things under him, so that God may be all in all, right? Remember with Yeshua, a difference in position does not mean a difference in essence. Yes, there is a hierarchy position. The Father is greater than the Son. But this does not pertain to their essence. This pertains to a position, okay? And then when it says that God may be all in all, all right, this is where we get that total equality again, that all three, okay? They took on these qualities, these positions and so forth because it was the Father's will. It was his plan. It was his mission and so forth. There's a lot I can say on that, but this in no way disproves the deity of Yeshua, okay? Just want to throw that out there also. All right, so verse, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 50. Now I say this, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, and what decays cannot inherit what does not decay. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last shofar, for the shofar will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. All right, so when is the last shofar? Well, I've always taught and believed at the end of the great tribulation, okay? And so, uh, but then you still have the thousand year reign of Yeshua. So could the last shofar, I mean, we're going to be hearing shofars all throughout the feast days, right? All throughout the millennial reign, there's going to be shofars being blown. And so could the last shofar be at the end after he's destroyed Hasetan, amen? And he's coming with the white throne judgment. Could that be the time of the last shofar when that shofar is blown? The great trump is blown. Could it still be on one of the feast days? Sure, it could be. But it could be at the end of the millennial reign, couldn't it? Very possible. Have to keep that as a possibility here. All right, so then it says, for this corruptible must put on incorruptibility, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this corruptible, will have put on incorruptibility, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then shall come to pass the same that is written, death is swallowed up in victory, where, O oh, death, is your victory, where, O oh, death, is your sting, right? So I'm still seeing a good argument for the end of the millennial reign is the rapture, okay? So far, going forward here, that seems to be the stronger argument. All right, so let's go on here to the 144,000 in chapter 20, I'm sorry, chapter 14 of the book of Revelation. So we know that in Revelation 7, we see here that um, we see that there is 144,000 that gets sealed during the time of the great tribulation, okay? And so then it says here in chapter 14, then I looked and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. And with him were 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and the booming loud voice. The voice I heard was like the harpist playing on their harps. And they are singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Okay. This seems to be a rapture. Okay. Now, did they die and were they resurrected? Possible. Or were they standing there alive and were resurrected? Okay, well, remember, it says that we who are alive okay, will not precede those what, who are dead. Okay, so we have to be careful how we do this one. All right, so the dead in Christ will rise first. So this gives me the impression that these guys died, okay? That these guys did die and they are redeemed. They are redeemed. So let's keep reading here. So this, did it happen at, at, after the thousand year reign or before the thousand year reign? Let's, let's see. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. 
these have been redeemed from among mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no lie. They are blameless. All right. So as far as we can tell, they fall in that category of first fruits with Yeshua. So this specific 144,000 falls in that category. Okay. So them being raised up doesn't affect the other ones. Because the, but the dead in Messiah will rise first. So to me, these guys had to have died, okay, from my perspective here. All right, let's go down a little bit farther down here, down to, well, we can see here that in verse 14, it says, then I looked and behold, there was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. This is Yeshua who had a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to the one seated on the throne, put the sickle and reap. For the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. Well, who is he reaping? They're reaping the wicked. So the one seated on the cloud slung his sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Then the angel came out of the temple in heaven and he also had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who had authority over fire, came out from the altar, and he called out with a loud voice to the one holding the sharp sickle, saying, put in your sickle and gather the grapes, clusters from the vineyard of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the grape winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was stopped on outside the city and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as the horse's griddle for 1600 stadia. So the first angel comes out, swings its sickle over the earth and the earth was harvested. Well, what was harvested? Could it be the 144,000? Okay, doesn't say exactly all or who, says the earth was harvested, okay? But earlier on here, we have that it is the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth. So this is a connection for me. I don't believe it was everyone. This is not after the thousand year reign. So the first harvest, okay? These guys would have been dead, okay? The first harvest would have came the 144,000. And then the next one is what? This one is harvesting the wicked. They're being thrown in the wine press, okay, of the wrath of God. So as we move on here, we see that in chapter 20 of the book of Revelation, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the abyss and a great chain. He sees the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil, and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He also threw him into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were complete. After these things, he must be released for a short while. Then I saw thrones and people sat upon them, those to whom authority to judge was given. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Yeshua and because of the word of what? Of God. They had not worshiped the beast or his image, nor had they received his mark on their foreheads or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. So th could this be connected to the 144,000? Sure. Or I mean, basically anyone who was beheaded during the great tribulation would come to life for that time. Could this be the 144,000 that were redeemed from the earth? Could this be that first sickle that was harvested? harvesting those from the earth okay uh, again paul says the dead in christ will rise first so there's not a, a rapture of alive people that's that's kind of how i'm seeing this so those who were beheaded or died for the cause of yeshua all right could have been the 144,000. it could even bleed over into more people that died and were beheaded but it's talking about that great tribulation period time they did not take the mark all right. So then it says the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. Okay. 
that's where I'm getting the idea that possibly, of course, the rest of the righteous that have, you know, all the way from the beginning of time up until the great tribulation period, they're still in the grave. They're still there. Okay. They're not part of the first fruits yet of Yeshua. They're not getting their glorified bodies yet. The 144,000 who have been redeemed from the earth and those who were beheaded for the cause, and they might be the same people. Those are being brought to life to judge. Okay. Because we're seeing thrones are being set. Those whom authority to judge was given. Okay. It seems like that's the 144,000 to me are those who have been beheaded for the cause of Yeshua during that great tribulation time. They are going to judge and reign with Yeshua for a thousand years. Then the rest of the dead did not come to life until a thousand years were completed. Remember, the dead and Messiah will rise first. Then those who are alive will be caught up to him in the air. So that's why I'm reevaluating this, re-looking at this. Okay, maybe post-trib might not be right. Maybe it maybe it's right and it's not right. It's kind of like, yes, you're gonna see a resurrection of the dead. The 144,000 are those who have been beheaded at the end of the Great Tribulation. So there is a post-trip rapture there. But, it, but I have always thought it's everybody, all the righteous at that point. Maybe not. Maybe it's not till the end. The rest of the righteous come forward. Okay? Because obviously then after the thousand years has ended, Satan shall be released from his prison. And let's read that one more time. Let's go ahead and go to that. So again, when the thousand years has ended, Satan shall be released from prison and he shall come out to deceive the nations at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the Kedoshim and the beloved city. Okay, Again, connecting this to Daniel chapter 12, the, the greatest time of tribulation ever for, the, for his people could be this time here. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. I'm sorry, but, but fire fell from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are too. And they shall be tortured day and night forever. Then I saw a great white throne and the one seated on it. The earth and heaven fled from his presence, but no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and small standing before the throne. The books were open. And another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what was written in the books, according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Sheol gave up the dead in them. Then they were each judged, each one of them, according to their deeds. This is the last day that we saw Yeshua speaking of and that Martha was speaking of. Okay, there you get the final judgment. So at the end of the thousand years, we could see. Those who are alive will not precede those who died before them. The dead in Messiah will rise first. Okay. There was a dead in Messiah who rise at the end of the great tribulation. 144,000 are those that were beheaded. They reigned with him for a thousand years. And then the rest of us get to be resurrected at the end of the thousand years. And those who are alive, who've seen everything that happened, get caught up with Yeshua in the air. And forever we will be with Yeshua, with the Lord. We're receiving the white throne judgment. We're receiving our new bodies, our rewards. We're going to get the new heavens and the new earth. Amen. And then new Yerushalayim is going to come out of heaven, the bride of Messiah. Amen. So a lot to think about. A lot to think about. Um, I am leaning towards this is becoming more consistent. All right. But I'm still going to look at it some more. I'm bringing it to your guys' attention. And I welcome all questions and thoughts and comments. All right. Um, you know, so there is a post-trib rapture. I believe there is. I'm just kind of questioning exactly who those are. It's not as many as I thought it would be, I'm thinking. And then the rest come at the end of the thousand years. So I hope this was helpful to you guys. Um, I've really enjoyed this study. I'm still going to be looking at it some more. And again, I welcome comments and questions. I don't know everything, uh, but definitely been spending a lot of time in this area lately. So. Until we meet again, everyone, shalom and blessings.